Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. He said, Islam began as something strange and it shall return once again as something strange. So I give good news of paradise to the strangers. Gnosticism is the first major threat to the church. Right? Gnosticism was the greatest challenge and greatest threat to the early church. The early history of the church was opposed by several mystery religions. Now, this is an overview. I'm going to be bringing multiple topics and we can explore each topic in detail later. But there were these mystery religions. The mystery was that they had secrets. You see, they, they knew the secret of the universe. They knew that secret knowledge that you don't have, secret knowledge that led to salvation. We are going to be talking about Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the belief, well, amongst its beliefs, is that the world of matter is evil and that the spirit alone is good, that the spiritual realm alone is good. My focus really is going to be on Islam, how Islam is a Gnostic religion. Gnosticism is the inversion of Christianity. It demotes Jesus. Mm -hmm. right. Very simply, it denies, in many cases, his divinity, or it, in some way it messes with that. But we're going to talk about how Islamic Gnosticism demotes Jesus. So the divine element returns to the spiritual realm when the gnosis or special secret knowledge of the divine is obtained. Salvation is, is based on obtaining this secret knowledge. Mm -hmm. right. So salvation is knowledge based, but they don't, ne don't necessarily mean just normal knowledge. Like one plus one is equal to two. Right. right. <clears throat> this is special knowledge, deep knowledge, real deep understanding, a, a really involved understanding. Okay. He said, Islam began as something strange and it shall return once again as something strange. So I give good news of paradise to the strangers. The Prophet was a stranger at first, the only Muslim on the face of the earth, not a single person praying with him the salawat. Can you imagine that feeling of strangeness? But with patience and perseverance and dua and sincerity and perpetual da'wah and having good suspect in Allah, this was the outcome. So this traveler, he is strange, he is gharib. However, this is not the strangeness that we are speaking about today, not this form of ghurbah. We are speaking about a different type of strangeness when traveling. This is the strangeness when traveling to Allah and the home of the hereafter. That Muslim, he is strange. Strange amidst the non-Muslims. Strange amidst the people of innovation. Strange amidst a setting that is not practicing as he is. He is gharib, he is strange. The first of these headings 
are the categories of ghurbah, strangeness. What are the categories of ghurbah? The first type of strangeness is the strangeness of a Muslim amidst the kuffar, the non-Muslims. He is strange. This is a reality that the Quran and the Sunnah have reinstated time and time again. That you, O Muslims, will always be a minority amidst the non-believing masses of disbelievers. about his own struggle and his feeling of ghurbah, strangeness, amidst the Muslims at his time. Listen to what he says in his remarkable work called Al-I'atisan. He says, I was hesitant, stuck in two minds. Should I follow the way of the Sunnah and go against everybody and what they accept? Or should I follow and go with the flow and just be like people, but to go against the Sunnah and the way of the Salaf, the Sahaba, and I realized that people will not be able to protect me from the punishment of Allah. So he chose that path and to go against people. But what was the outcome, he says? He says, people, when they saw me choosing this path, Muslims, they erupted against me. And they accused me of all sorts. And they blamed me of all sorts. And they attributed me to ignorance and to innovation and misguidance and following desire and I was accused of being a fool and a man of ignorance. He says, however, I also realized that this heavy luggage of going against people to follow the way of the messengers will also bring with it a heavy luggage of reward in the hereafter. A Muslim who feels different amidst his own family, amidst his own school friends, university or at work, and they may be Muslims. This is painful. Be good to the people of Sunnah because they are strangers. Our messenger was sent to a community where paganism was rife and the waves of idolatry were thunderous. A community who were die-hard stone idol worshippers. And they would worship the most pathetic of things. So I want you to imagine what they're going to do to a man who is speaking against their idols. He was at an uphill struggle. The strangeness of a Muslim amidst Muslims themselves. You may find an individual who has taken it upon himself to follow the way of the messenger. He is now receiving critique and blame and insults from the Muslims themselves. They have an issue now with the length of his beard. This is ghurbah, strangeness within the Muslim community. Or a brother may feel strange because people mock him for not having a house to his name and he's now 30 or 40 years old. So he feels strange amidst the Muslims. Allah Almighty says, and think about these ayat, brothers and sisters. He says, فَأَبَا أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ إِلَّا كُفُورًا the majority of people accept nothing but disbelief. Allah Almighty, only a few people accepted the message of Nuh alayhi salam. Allah Almighty says, if you were to follow the majority of people, they will push you away from the path of Allah. Allah Almighty says, we have brought the truth, but the majority of you hate the truth. And Allah Almighty, he says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Except those who believe and they do good deeds, and they are very few, Allah Almighty says. Imam al ajuri he would say, whoever wants to reach the high level of being a stranger, then he must show patience towards the bitterness shown at him from his mother and father, from his wife, from his children and his relatives. It needs patience. Because it is difficult to feel that you are at odds with people. But however, you are dealing with a just ilah, a kind ilah, a very fair Lord ilah. And he will not allow your feeling of strangeness to go unpaid, to go without reward, to go without gratitude. Therefore, with that in mind, my proposal is the following. The reason I, I 
I'm now convinced there's no historical Jesus, which seems a real, like, whoa, to people who are not familiar with the idea, it is a combination of things. First of all, there is no evidence for an historical man which stands up to proper scrutiny. Secondly, is the story of Jesus is full of these motifs which come from the pagan mysteries. And the third reason is because in the early Christian movement there's these two types of Christians, certainly by the second century, which I think of as Gnostics and Literalists. What marks out the Literalists who will become the Roman Empire and the Roman Catholic Church is that they've got an historical man. What marks out the Gnostics is that they see it allegorically and their great heresy is that Christ didn't come in the flesh. Now, the winners write history, and the history books have been written by the literalists. So, voila, here I am, the modern version of the fake Jesus. <laughs> the Ghurba was removed. Thus he would say Islam began as something strange. That was the first. And it's going to return to be something strange as it once started. Therefore, when the second Ghurba, the second strangeness of Islam arrives, when Islam goes weak once again, and the people of the truth become few again, what will come after this? There is glad tidings for those who see that. So yes, it is not strange for a Muslim to feel strange amidst people who are not like him practicing. He is accused of all sorts. You are a stranger. Because out of all of these strangeness, do you know any other ghurba that takes a person to paradise? Didn't he say, Fatuba lil ghuraba? Paradise is for the strangers. Allah says, Don't you understand? Don't you see that everything in the heavens and the earth prostrate to Allah? Allah says, And so does the sun, so does the moon, and so do the stars, and so do the trees and so do the mountains, and so do the animals, and so do many people. You are strange, gharib, yes, but only in the eyes of people, not in the eyes of Allah, and not in the eyes of the universe that Allah has established upon the system of Islam as well. You are a stranger relative to people only. Let us ask, who is the gharib? Who is the stranger? Who is the stranger? So that I know whether I am a person who qualifies to be at this high level, and a man who guarantees, bi a place in Jannah, for that feeling of being different to others. Am I a gharib, a stranger? Or am I like everybody else? Speaking about these strangers, he said, they are a people who remain righteous, when those around them become corrupt. He says they are the people who rectify what other people have corrupted from my sunnah after me. So notice, not only are there righteous people, not only are they righteous people who pray and fast and wear hijab and give da'wah, but they are also actively trying to reform and change others as well. They say no. We go back to the sunnah of the messenger. Even if you will say we are, we are strangers. They are those who rectify what others have corrupted. The Messenger وسلم, he was asked, Man humul but Who are the strangers or Messenger of Allah? And he said, He says, they are a righteous group of people who exist within a huge crowd of corrupt people. And those who go against them are more than those who obey them. They have more enemies than they have friends. And those who show them disobedience are more than those who express obedience. These are the characteristics of the strangers. A hadith which shows a similar meaning. You, O Muslims, in comparison to the disbelievers, you are like a single strand of white hair amidst the body of a black bull. Every time, Allah Almighty speaks about a majority in the Qur'an, He criticizes it. And every time Allah speaks about a minority in the Qur'an, Allah Almighty praises it. The Bedouins say, we have believed. Say, you have not yet believed. But say instead, we have submitted. For faith has not yet entered your hearts.
And if you obey Allah and his messenger, he will not deprive you from your deeds of anything. It, it, it took me a minute to like fully grasp this one right here. Yeah. So the ulama. So you were saying that the scholars um, are you, you said earlier that the scholars are as far above the, the normal people as Muhammad is above the least amount of people. Right. So basically you're saying that the scholars are the highest echelon possible, the highest authorities when it comes to understanding and interpreting the religion of Islam. Gotcha. So the 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 lay Muslim, the um, you know, the internet uh, jihadi Muslim that we interact with for the most part, when we show them, you know, perhaps embarrassing hadith or an embarrassing rulings um, from Sharia manuals and and what the ulama have stated, and they disagree with them, essentially they are kicked out of Islam. I mean, like how how can how can a normal person sit there and say that they they know more than the ulama when Muhammad himself said that uh, they're they're above yeah. basically even him. Oh Abdullah, be in the life of this world like a stranger or a traveler a passerby. This is the situation of a traveler. His heart never becomes attached to the vehicle or the road that he is upon or the service stations that he uses for rest. Rather, his eyes are fixed permanently on the final destination and he will not rest till he gets to that destination. So is it possible after we hear of such a prize for being a steadfast, gharib, stranger. We must pounce at the opportunity. But let's have a look at Islam, since we're talking about knowledge. Let's look through the index of the Sharia, of the most popular Islamic law manual. Knowledge of the heart, community, communally obligatory knowledge, religious sciences, gonna get to that. This worldly knowledge, recommended knowledge, subjects that are not sacred knowledge, unlawful knowledge, offensive knowledge, permissible knowledge. Read to the Sharia, it's all coded. Knowledge, 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 everywhere. This mm -hmm. term of the Nasis is everywhere. And yeah. they speak of the superiority of sacred knowledge over devotions. Devotions are things like prayer, things that are pillars of your religion. So having sacred knowledge trumps everything. Now, while he says, say, are those who know, those who have knowledge, the ulama, ulama are what? The people of knowledge. And alim is someone of knowledge. What are the Taliban? Well, Taliban comes from, right? These are the students of knowledge. Taliban is a student, right? Mm -hmm. Student of knowledge. Are those who know and those who do not know equal? Quran 39.9. Well, no, because those who have special knowledge. Allah raises those of you who believe and those who have been given knowledge whole degrees. Quran 58.11. Mm. Whoever Allah wishes well, he gives knowledge, gnosis of the religion. The superiority of the learned Muslim over the devotee is as my superiority over the least of you. The scholars, the learned Muslim is the scholar, understand? Mm. So the scholar is so far above the basic Muslim, the lay Muslim, as Muhammad is over the least of the basic Muslims. And unfortunately, this, this really upsets me when I think of academics. They call it Christian Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. These were forms of Christianity. They will call it multiple Christianities early on. So what was Jesus' message? In Luke 4.43, Christ in His own words described His purpose. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. His message was the good news of the kingdom of God. Do you know what Christ was talking about? This kingdom is the focus of Jesus' message, yet it's often been misunderstood or even ignored.
So Gnosticism is the cult of special knowledge. It comes from the Greek word the Gnosis, or knowledge. Now, let's consider the strong overlap here with the law. We're going to be talking about this. Gnosticism has a belief in a remote, supreme, absolute one deity called the Monad. This is the Gnostic supreme deity, the supreme god, right? So Allah happens to be a remote, supreme, absolute one deity, complete expression of Islam. It is not just the following the law of Allah, obeying his will. It is also following, or rather knowing the character of Allah, contemplating the nature of Allah. It is a religious philosophy and a worldview. It's a framework to explain the nature of God and creation. Right, so its own it's, it is its own creation narrative, mm -hmm. right? It also tries to explain good and evil, and in brackets you see the problem of evil. It tries to explain the problem of evil. Yeah. It also speaks about man and the purpose of life. And Gnostics do tend to focus on the inner life of the spirit, mm -hmm. which they differentiate from the material life. Gnosticism is the belief that salvation comes through secret knowledge, also known as sacred knowledge, also known as sacred science, mm -hmm. right? Gnosticism is the idea that the physical world is corrupt, even evil, unlike the ideal spiritual realm, and that the material realm is created and ruled by a lesser god, potentially even an evil god in some interpretations. Yep. So Gnosticism is a religious dualist system of belief arising in the second century. Now, understand that before you had Christian Gnosticism, you had Jewish Gnosticism, mm -hmm. right? So Gnosticism goes way back, long before Christianity. So, but now you have Christian Gnosticism. So this goes back to the second century and it held that matter is evil, that spirit is good. And it claimed that salvation was attained only through esoteric knowledge or the Gnosis, the Gnosis, the Greek Gnosis. Now let's have a look at the word esoteric. Esoteric means designed for or understood by the specially initiated alone, which is understood only by a small group of scholars. Mm -hmm. B, requiring or exhibiting knowledge that is restricted to a small group of scholars. It is limited to a small circle. It is special. It is rare. That is what esoteric means. Keep, the, keep that in mind. The most popular common Sunni Islamic manual in the world, right? Islamic law manual in the world has this many references to Gnosis. Notice for Gnosis, there's 18 references. For Gnostic, there are five. For Gnostics, there are three. And Gnostics, one, hmm. right? With an apostrophe. So let's go. Gnosticism involves levels of understanding. Islam most explicitly has levels of understanding where you have to be initiated into different levels. You have to gain secret knowledge and then move up to various levels. There's also the denial of Jesus' divinity, his death, resurrection, and humanity. Various aspects of these are part of Gnosticism as well as Islam. And then of course you have radical reinterpre reinterpretation of biblical doctrine. This of course is part and parcel of Islam. Let's have a look. The Gnostic's spiritual will, exalted above all else, must carry him beyond what we have just mentioned. He is outside of our frame of reference and all it contains. And then he you know, takes into the afterlife and, and secrets of the universe. Someone who has reached the level of those to whom the unseen is disclosed and have Gnostic insight. We've opened the door of Gnosis, the door of knowledge, when they sniff the first traces of this knowledge. Right? Gnosis, the knowledge while immersed in the sea of Gnostic inspiration, right? Faith is comprehended through Gnosis, the Islamic faith comprehended through Gnosis, the grove of the Gnostics, the chess of the Gnostics, then reaching, reaching the throne room of Allah, reaching to perfection, reaching to salvation. See Gnosis, interesting, Gnosis, subsistence. Gnosis, 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 you get the point. So, let's look at the Hakika, plural Hakaik, reality, essence, truth. 
in exegesis, the basic meaning of a word or an expression and is distinguished from blah, from metaphor. So it is reality. It is the real, the actual, the truth, the ground truth, the fundamental truth. In philosophy, the, okay, the ontological meaning is translated as nature or essential reality. The logical meaning is the truth, which is the exact conception of the thing established in the intelligence. So this is mean with the mind perfectly absolutely understand something mm -hmm. but this is a knowledge beyond the rational it's a knowledge beyond rational knowledge in mysticism it is the profound reality to which only experience of union communion with allah opens the way now the al hakika al muhammadiya okay is the universal rational principle through which the divine knowledge is transmitted to all the prophets and the saints called the Ruh muhammad or the spirit of muhammad so understand according to islamic thought at the highest levels of its scholars the true understanding of the universe is through the fact of the Mohammedan reality. Muhammad understood reality in a profound way because Muhammad is the direct path to God. No one comes to the Father but through me, as Muhammad said. And, mm -hmm. he is the, and the spirit of Muhammad is what infuses the saints. The spirit of Muhammad, you may have heard of it. It's in the Bible, it's called the Holy Ghost. And Haqqaiq right. is the term for secret philosophical doctrines and we need to dig a little more into this somebody said basically so the hikaka the uh, the okay. mysticism is the highest level of islam correct yes yeah, so you've got your fall remember you've got your ibara ishara right and the, the yasir qadis and shabi shabi sheikhs and all that they're mm -hmm. on the ishara level and then the next level is the saints of islam are sufis they're all sufis so the next two levels of understanding right it's strictly it's a pyramid and you get to the top the pyramid by the way and then you get to the yeah. top and you've got the sufis and they have the secret understanding of the character of allah the nature of allah that gnostic thinking has definitely infiltrated um in into islam and is probably more alive and well in islam than it is in any other kind of um, religious ideologies the ulama the people of knowledge so related words alim faqih ulama ulama the term denoting scholars of almost all disciplines, although more specifically, scholars of the religious sciences. They're regarded as the guardians, the transmitters, and the interpreters of religious knowledge. This is from Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali is the number one scholar of Islam, above even the four Imams, right? Who founded the four schools of jurisprudence. And he's the number one scholar of Islam, just below Muhammad. Okay, so he's the greatest scholar who ever lived besides Muhammad. This is in his book, the Ikhya Ulama. No, 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 it's not. It's in the Mishkat al Anwat, the Niche for Lights. And this book makes many, oopsie, sorry, <coughs> makes many direct references to Gnosticism. The concepts of Gnosticism, of Amr, right, contains much that is obscure and too difficult for most minds. Okay? The perfect Illuminati perceived that al mutta the obeyed one, is not more than the highest other than absolute deity and is related to him as the sun to essential light. So, you see, those who stopped short of complete illumination, right? Those who didn't really understand the Gnosticism, who didn't become illuminated, right? Those who were not mm -hmm. illuminated, it's very hard to understand. But what he says here is that the Gnostics are the perfect Illuminati. We just saw that the ulama are a permanent government behind changing dynasties, a secret government, a deep state that remains despite the changes of governments. Let's look at the Encyclopedia of Islam. They speak of the Gnosis, the Marifa, which he describes. So Dulnun was the first to teach the true nature of Gnosis. Now, this is the first Islamic scholar to really talk about the, Gnosi, the Gnostics. The Gnosis. He describes this as knowledge of the attributes of the unity. And he speaks of the saints. When they say saints, they mean highest in Islam, the highest spiritual level in Islam. They are the highest ones. And they contemplate the face of God within their heart. And God revealed himself to them in a way in which he is not revealed to others in the world. They can see God in a way that no one else can. Right, and and it, it pronounces that there's only one God, right? Which is fine. I think everybody agrees with that. Mm -hmm. But then, how do I actually 
get to that God, right? It is through pronouncing as his prophet. So in fact, um, I, I would I would agree with Daniel at that, at that point, right? So like you literally cannot enter paradise um, unless you pronounce that as the prophet. In so fact, he according is according to your, the Islamic law, according to Sharia, and I probably show this later. Allah does not accept your submission. Allah does not accept your faith unless you accept. It. Nor mm -hmm. is this in the Quran explicitly stated anyway. The, the, the Shahada that Muslims follow is not in the Quran, right? There's only right. a Shahada that speaks of Allah. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He said he's going to talk to you in parables. 13 and 10, it says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Because every time he's in public, this is what he speaks. And he answered and said, because it is given unto you to know the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Period. This is why he can separate it. Let's go over here and go a little bit deeper. Let's go to Mark 4 and 10. Mark 4 and 10. And we're going to get a little bit deeper with that to, to where you completely understand why Jesus actually always spoke in parables. Mark 4 and 10, and we're going to see here, because he's going to say pretty much the same thing, but he's going he gonna to give you a little bit more details in this one. Mark 4 and 10, it says, And when, and when he was alone, and they, and, they were, and they were about with him, and the twelve asked him the parable. Now they're asking him the parable now. And he said unto them, Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to them are without. All these things are done in parables. That sin is what he's getting ready to say. That sin they may see, but not perceive. That's why it's in a parable. It's in a celestial language. So you can see it, but you still ain't going to get it. And he said, in hearing that you may hear and not understand. Least at any time they should be converted. You sit down there and you listen to the one that he sent to you and then you get it and you humble yourself. Then at least at any time you be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Because when you have someone teaching you that way and they not doing it, you breaking it down. And now I'm going to show you a simple parable, which most people will sit there and this is one of the ones that the preachers use all the time. But the ones we're going to get into, I guarantee you never even hear it. You never even hear about it. Let's go over here and test this. Let's go over to Luke 8. We're going to go to Luke 8. And we're going to park right over there at 9. Luke 8 and park at 9. And right there, it tells you right there, Luke 8 9. It says, the disciple asked him, saying, what might this parable be? And he said unto them, and he, and he said unto you that you might know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to other par in, in parables, seeing that they might not see and hearing that they might not uh, understand. This is, again, now the parable is this. Now he's getting ready to tell them the parable. This parable has been told so many times over and over in churches and churches and churches and churches. These, these parables, they get. But this Bible is 85% parables. And he tells and he tells the parable is this the seed is the word of God. Everybody, this is common. But you're gonna see in some parabolic language where you're not gonna even get it if you're not celestial. And then those, and then it says, Those by the wayside are they that hear and come in, and the devil taketh away the word out of their hearts. And why he's saying take it out of their heart, at least they should believe and might be saved. And seeing, and that belief is having the faith and following the commandments of God. What you do, you go right over here to Jeremiah, and this is why he say, you, you, he say, and it takes it right out of their heart. 
We're going to find out why he's saying heart, because that's I'm going to show you the precept on this here and go to Jeremiah 31. And this is the precept to that one, which I'm pretty sure if you're in a celestial, if you're in a terrestrial church, they don't, they're not going to precept that one. They're going to take you somewhere else and tell you something else. But I'm going to show you why he said that. 31 and 33. And this is what it says right there. And it says that, <clears throat> that this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law on the, on the inward parts and write, and write on their hearts. And I will, and I will be their God and they will be my people. So he's going to put his, he said, I'm going to put my law in the inner parts. He's going to write it up on their hearts. This is what he was saying all the time. So as he sold the word and people takes it in, it's sewn up on your heart to which you know, that's how you know you're his. And you're going to take it with joy. And you're going to start, you're going to start trying to follow. You're going to start trying to follow what he's doing. Cause he said, you got to follow him. So we got to understand what this is always, always saying. So when you're not doing that, you're doing whatever you want to do. So you have some walking around thinking they have the Holy Spirit and don't. And, and they, and they, and they want to know how to receive the Spirit. It is a fault to stop at the first traces of Gnosis. You see, you need to continue. You can't, you have to continue and push through, right? Because others have claimed to have attained to Gnosis and contemplative knowledge of the divine, to have passed through spiritual stations and states and to have reached nearness to Allah. And they have thereof no knowledge. They follow not except assumption. And indeed, assumption avails not against the truth at all. If you wish to look at the gatherings of the prophets, then go and look at the gatherings of the people of knowledge. He said, you'll see that during this gathering, a man will come. And he'll say, I did such and such and such. Is my wife